Sanitarium is an isometric point-and-click psychological horror adventure game developed by Dreamforge Entertainment. Dreamforge. It ain't entertainment. It is entertainment. And it was released for PC in 1998. It was also ported to mobile phones in 2015, but who gives a shit? I'm not playing an adventure game on my fucking telephone. Get real. It was released to pretty unanimous praise with many touting it as a return to form for point and click adventures that came out of nowhere, except for one guy in the UK who called it sickening and covered in the fingerprints of Satan. Several publications nominated it as adventure game of the year, but in nearly every case, Sanitarium lost to Grim Fandango, we, which I get, it's, it's a tough call. On one hand, really subversive weird point and click adventure game, on the other hand, game that has grim in the title so obviously I'm drawn towards it. This is a game I have a very clear recollection and reverence for. I remember playing the demo for it and being captivated. It was different, it was mysterious, and I hadn't played a game like it. It felt adult and realized in a way I hadn't experienced before. Completely formative in my love of the genre. You hear this shit? Uh, it expanded what I thought games to be capable of. It's been a good 10 years since I last replayed it, uh, more than enough time to perhaps have different opinions on it for it to affect me differently. And when I first started shoveling my inaccurate, poorly constructed, mistake-riddled content onto the internet, this was one of several games I kept on the back burner, thinking, I'm not ready to revisit it. I still think that, but... Ugh, look, I'm sorry guys, uh, that's, that's my neighbor. Clearly he's got a lot of important things he's got to do. I'm, I'm sorry that's interrupting this video, but you know what? You know what? Joke's on him, because I can't afford to live here anymore, so... Alright, I'll try to talk around your work as a Foley artist up there. Ooh, I know that sound. That's dragging a dead body. So fucking goddamn it! It's like every time I try to speak. There it is. Look, there's a lot working against me right now, but I'm gonna get this video out. I promise. Sanitarium has an intriguing opening that competently sets up what it's here to do. It's here to present a psychological mystery, perplex you with jarring shifts in tone, and to present a character you can empathize with. A man named Max is driving down a windy road in the rain, leaving a voice message to someone about a breakthrough he's made. Doesn't really matter though because he was driving irresponsibly, and he flies off the road. He wakes up with his head wrapped in bandages, and in an archaic but extravagantly designed insane asylum. He has no memory of who he is or how he came to be there. There doesn't seem to be any management or employees around, and the patients that remain are all deeply afflicted by different mental illnesses, providing sparse information on where he is and who he is. Finding a strange key, he inserts it into a stone angel that seems to come alive, and it wraps its wings around him and transports him to a strange, alternate dimension. This is a world populated entirely by profoundly deformed children, who have established a weird society in this parentless, abandoned town they inhabit. From here on out, you start to see brief flashbacks to Max's life and can piece together some idea of who he was and what he's been through. What I enjoy about this segment and also find equally unpleasant is the way Max interacts with these kids. The writers and voice actors do a great job of making these children feel like children. It's hard to get anything useful out of them as far as information, and they've been left alone to fend for themselves for so long they don't really treat Max with any respect or as though he has any authority there. They've been living out an existence somewhere between Lord of the Flies and Children of the Corn. They all seem to answer to someone they call Mother, who punishes them by disfiguring them in a pumpkin patch that they are all clearly terrified to wind up in. It, it's immediately incredibly f up, and, and it isn't afraid to play this extremity as comedy. It's so over-the-top bleak that it's unavoidably kind of funny. At one point, the leader of the kids puts Max through a game of hide-and-seek, asserting that he'd never figure out their secret weapon. And after finding all the kids, we learn that the secret weapon was that one of them was dead and buried, thus being nearly impossible to find and making it impossible for him to win. Max, not perturbed by this curveball, digs up the dead girl and her brother promptly sits her in the back of a wagon and drags her around. Now I know what you're thinking, this is, is this is really just 
awesome. You no, know, it's super fucked up and weird. I don't, I don't know how they get away with this nowadays. Not even the Borderlands franchise is enough of an edgelord to make that joke. I mean, there's a happy ending. The kid's happy to see his sister. It, she, she's just, she's just dead as shit. We continue to experience flashbacks while hopping back and forth between other worlds and the asylum, learning more about the suspicious circumstances of his accident and an emotionally traumatizing event in his past. I still think it's a really unique and daring, if a little insensitive and maybe problematic story. It's very much a remnant of mid to late 90s adventure game edginess. Games like Harvester, Ripper, Phantasmagoria 1 and 2, Gabriel Knight, they seem to be trying to outdo each other with violence, profanity, and sexiness. It was a real wild time. It's not incredibly groundbreaking. We've achieved more cerebral and psychological things in gaming, and it's not without its low points. One sequence where you play as an Aztec warrior comes to mind because it feels the least inventive, the least creepy, and it was just kind of a bummer being separated from Max and other characters that are at least indirectly involved in the plot. The metaphoric charm of it wears off real quick, and it ends up being a lot of walking back and forth, talking to very slow speaking ghosts. Jeez, like it's horrible being dead. Hey I, hey, I got something for you, why don't you try being alive sometime? It's not so great either. There is something really captivating about this game, and how unabashedly bizarre it's willing to go, while maintaining a heartfelt story about a person and consumed by guilt, interspersing this between atmospheric Stephen King-like vignettes that are littered with imagery that stays with mother f They're littered with imagery that stays with you. Ever since my first time playing it, a moment that remained imprinted in my head was getting into the asylum's church and seeing a straitjacket clad man preaching to a congregation of wooden mannequins. It was another formative moment. I was like, what, nine? and it opened up some mental pathway. What is art? Video games is art? Yeah, then I went back to whatever dumb shit kids in the 90s were doing. Goddamn Street Sharks, a game where you, th where you throw sharpened rocks at each other. Rock ball. <sighs> just die already. I like how human Max is. He's just a, he's just a sweet little peach. Oh God. It's terrible. Always appalled and disgusted by every dead body or horrifying scene he comes across, and the oddly cute way he talks to the kids as if they aren't freaks. I want this guy to make it to the end. I want his suffering to stop. I love his really goofy one-liners and dad jokes. I guess he thought it was better to burn up than fade away. I want him to live a happy life with a house, a dog. He can adopt that girl with the tree legs. Give her a good home. Buy her some old English. This is a really well-paced and accessible point-and-click adventure game. Some pixel hunting aside, all puzzles and item combinations feel really logical and easy to comprehend. Some might confuse you just based on their presentation, but it's really forgiving and the majority of them are quite creative. There's one where you have to play different records over the loudspeaker in the asylum to inhibit different reactions in the patients. There is a maze later on, and I don't like mazes. They are architecturally complete nonsense, just make a hallway. All all this could have been a hallway, guys. Okay, save me a lot of grief. This one is not that bad, though, and it's probably because there isn't much in the way of real danger or stakes. Even though you are put in perilous situations where you have to defend yourself, you can't really die. Your health is measured by your heart rate, and when you've been defeated, you are merely sent back to the beginning of the area. Oh no, that girl's dead. Oh no, she's gonna be okay. The gameplay is minimal and streamlined, and honestly, not the focus. Its atmosphere and story are clearly the stars of the show. This formula is really enjoyable, however, and would go on to inspire games like Motherfuck. In each area, you'll do a lot of talking with characters to gather clues. A lot of it. It's very linear and can only really be completed in one order, but there are some things you can learn or interactions you can have that are entirely superfluous if you just want to make it to the end. Controlling Max isn't ideal. I love an isometric perspective, but this is like a less cooperative Diablo. You have to click and hold and then drag the mouse around, which can cause some annoyances like having Max get too close to a flight of stairs, which triggers him to automatically climb them. And some of the other characters you can control move a little sluggishly. And there's some backtracking, but I was enjoying everything else enough to the point where that kind of stuff didn't get to me. I mean, 
it's gonna be all right. So you spend a little extra time playing a video game. What are you, are you too busy to play video games? You got other things to do? You probably do. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have come on that strong. Cause you see other people in the world, they're trying to do something worthwhile. You know, what am I doing? Fucking dicking around. Uh, perfect, can I say that? <laughs> I'm kidding, of course I can. To my eyes, this game's everything I love about retro PC games. I love games that look like this. I love the perspective, the 3D animated sprites and pre-rendered environments. It's charming as heck. Every environment is full of fun details, like this guy endlessly slamming his head into a wall, or this group of children curiously singing hand in hand around a pumpkin. I, I don't know what it is, but there's something not right about that pumpkin. Kiss back away. That's not a good pumpkin. Away with you. Everyone has those charming idol animations that breathe so much life into the game. Violent or unsettling things have this added layer of grossness to them. Maybe it's something to do with how archaic the graphics actually are. It's like, I get the impression or the implication that what we're seeing is only a fraction of how disgusting this truly is. And it's already pretty icky. I'm so fascinated by how this game looks. There's a part where you're on the roof of the asylum and it's raining and I could just stare at that forever. I don't know what it is, I got computer eyes or something. Cut scenes are kind of rough, both in animation and video quality. It's like they're already kind of grainy because of the interlacing and then they've intentionally dropped like a scratchy film grain on top of it. They are no doubt why the game needed to span three discs though, because there is a lot of them. And they're charming in their own way, but I, I don't have a worthwhile excuse for saying that. Assisting the visuals in painting Sanitarium's atmosphere is the soundtrack, which is mostly comprised of moody, melancholic ambient tracks. But there are others that are kind of playful and silly, still with a menace behind them. One track that plays during the carnival chapter comes to mind. It's like a joyful calliope that becomes a funerary dirge. Probably the most singularly inexplicable thing about this game is the absurdity that is the final credits song, which is like a Casio preset keyboard beat with different voice snippets thrown on top. What? I wish I knew, man. Why? That stuff is with a bird. What? Who are you? Why? Are your memories halfway in need of sun? Why? Um. The dawn of the insectoid. All right, all right. You did tell me you got Dead Mouth 5 to work on this track. I didn't see his name anywhere in the credits, but I know his work. <laughs> yeah, but after a while, I started to think that maybe there is something sweet to it being there. Like in a weird way, it shows how much fun the developers were having. Voice acting seems to have gotten mixed reviews, being as the sound quality can be kind of compressed, and I would absolutely recommend adjusting the audio to make voices much louder than everything else, because by default, the ambience and music completely eat over dialogue. What's this dummy saying? I can't hear him over Earth. The background ambience sound effect for certain areas like the futuristic Cyclops bug planet are deeply unpleasant. It's just a dense disharmony of disgusting squishing and squealing on top of a choir of weird hybrid babies calling for their mother. <laughs> Fucking nauseating. And I mean all this entirely as a compliment, by the way. I love it. Max, in particular, has a tendency to overact. Can I ask you something? Can I ask your name? It's not great, but it has a charming early Silent Hill protagonist charm to it. Yeah, he sounds a little sleepy and confused, and like he's not sure what emotion and how much of it he should be outputting. Her hands and face are deformed. I like all the voice acting though. Some of it is goofy and over the top, but everyone is giving 100% and completely committing to their characters. I brought you the proof you asked for, Draven. Are you going to help me buy the makers? Stay away from my child! Or up here, you like a potato, you ratted thing! All the kids sound really creepy because they sound like they probably are kids. Well, mother won't let me talk to strangers, so you'd better leave. And kids are creepy. They're like adults, only small. How does that not terrify you? Sanitarium is a short and sweet horror adventure classic that remains as charming as ever, sort of 
most of the time. I don't know how well it functions as a horror game. It's more like an atmospheric horror themed adventure game. Thus, there is an air of lightheartedness and dry, dark humor despite some moments being quite graphic and genuinely dark. The story is fun and occasionally touching and is constructed pretty solidly. By the end, you're probably not going to be blown away by some crazy revelation. It becomes more of a simplified good guy, bad guy power struggle by the end. But it's a nice enough bow to put on it. There are much less satisfying endings out there. Gameplay is easy to comprehend and a good entry into the genre, with some challenge, but a lot less of that confounding adventure game logic that can be off-putting. It looks delightful as all heck has a spooky soundtrack, it's just a good time. I think most people would agree. Just check out Steam, you got 319 smart people and 16 dum-dums. What are these dummies saying? What do they gotta say? This game has not aged well at all. If you played it as a kid, be happy with the memories and don't ruin them with a replay. But I did replay it. It's too late, there's nothing you can do about it. I am a huge point and click fan, but this game is a perfect example of why the genre fell off the face of the earth for a decade. Movement is painful, as well as inventory management. What inventory management? You right click on your character and you see all your items. It even tells you what they are when you hover over them in case you're a DUMMY! What are you doing? The game advertises as a dark, disturbing exploration of an insane mind. This, of course, is not true in a number of ways. First, the game is rated T, ages 13 plus. How dark and disturbing could it be? As it turns out, not very. I mean, I don't get it. It says T on the box. That's the advertiser. Where did it mislead you? You got plot points involving domestic violence and child abuse. There's lots of mutilated bodies and disfigured kids. Some might find that a little bit dark. I understand though, you are a lord of darkness. The exploration is of the different worlds, not the insane mind, and anything you discover during gameplay has little to no relevance to the plot. Look, I think a lot of this game is intentionally left to your interpretation, but this is sort of made easy for you to pick apart. I think you're supposed to doubt what is reality, and in all probability, none of it is real, and all of it is psychological allegory. From the moment you are given control of your character, they give you hints to how interconnected every world you visit is, including the asylum. It's why each one of the patients in the tower act as portents to each of the worlds. One doesn't want to talk to you because their mother told them not to. One thinks he is a circus performer before falling off a ledge. One is convinced he's being attacked by bugs and one claims to hear the voices of fallen warrior spirits. There is very clear connective tissue between chapters and reoccurring themes, like monstrous parental figures, vulnerable children, jilted lovers. These things repeat for a reason, at least in my opinion. The game does make a statement about the designer's ideas on sanity and the human mind, but it also leaves you wondering why they decided to call it a game. Does it? It's a game, Hugh. I bought it at Kmart, I installed it and played it. I'm not, you, you can't, you can't tell me that didn't happen. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the fact that it has for a long time appeared on various lists and retrospectives, pushing it as some kind of underground cult horror masterpiece. It's a shame because it's a good game. It's really creepy, but I don't think its intention was ever to be horrific. It's too goofy and absurd, but that's what makes it special. I don't know how that could be so bothersome. It's supposed to be fun. A lot of modern horror games seem to lose sight of that idea that games can have scary concepts but still be fun. I mean, it's not fun to play in any way. Yeah, I also don't want to make you feel bad if this is still frightening for you. If you still had a real reaction to the game's content, because I can understand that. I'm afraid of a lot of things that the vast majority of people have seemingly no problem with. Like commitment, adulthood, authority figures, public places, paying rent, watching my older content, social interactions, intimacy, roller coasters, children, my own reflection, any species or category of insect, the ocean, and uh, fear itself. Hey, special thanks to Resurrection, Game Master, Ailing Uncle, and to Jesus Christ I love you Mandalore. I missed you last time. I'm sorry. I'm an idiot. I admit it. Hopefully you'll forgive me and uh, accept my love for you. Anyway, thanks a lot. 
means a lot to me. You guys are my heroes. On honestly, not not doing too good over here. Lots of lots of personal baloney. I won't I won't I won't bother you with. But the fact that you guys are around, you really you willing to do that for me means a lot. Thanks a lot for donating at any tier. You guys are the best, and um, I'll see you around that internet. That was stupid.